Carter Malloy Publishing presents Drowning in Oceans of Black, written by Brandon Ford, read by Michael Butler. The soles of white sneakers sunk deeper into moist earth, crushing fresh grass as Justin Fitzgerald paced impatiently outside a baseball diamond. Beneath a starlit sky, he fought to stay clear of orange safety lights installed by the city the summer before. There'd been a few muggings in and around the area, and so preventative matters were taken. Justin felt a stab of disappointment when an unknown presence arrived at their front stoop, bearing a petition signed by hundreds of concerned citizens. Via mental telepathy, he tried to force the pen shooting from his mother's hand as she prepared to sign, wanted to send the petition and the clipboard holding it in place spinning from the hands of the Good Samaritan and on to the newly clipped frontage where the wind would carry those names into oblivion, never to be found. For Justin, as well as the kids in neighboring homes, the ballpark had been a place to spend summer afternoons during pre-adolescence. Now, as he rapidly approached his 17th year, the batting cage, as well as the steel bleachers nearby, had become an area of experimentation. Two summers before, he'd shared his first six-pack with Dean Phoenix, some weeks before Dean and family moved to Reading. It became something of a weekend ritual, Jimmy Durano and Jay Bentley quickly taking Dean's place. Before long, a ritual became a challenge, to see who could score the most cans before reporting to the bleachers at the designated time. Often, that required lifting a can a day from their parents' refrigerators and finding some place to stockpile them before the weekend rolled around. Sometimes it required loitering outside various convenience stores until a willing university co-ed pulled up. It was easy to find the bars and liquor stores closest to the college campuses. All the answers to the universe held within their palms. And that's where kids of legal age would grab a couple of kegs for that weekend's blowout. If you asked real nice, or tossed them 20 bucks, they might add a 12-pack to their purchases. While the boys were perfectly content with carrying on as usual, Justin wanted something different. He wasn't sure what the bottle of pills were when he found them stashed in his older brother's bedroom, but after typing the printed text along the tablet's smooth surface into a search engine, he found he held the keys to the kingdom. Fentanyl. There were 22 in the bottle. Justin knew. He poured them onto the desk and counted them one at a time. Rich wouldn't miss three. And even if he did, so what? This was the first time Justin was in complete control. There was literally nothing Rich could do short of turning himself in for possessing a controlled substance without a prescription. If he wanted, Justin could take the whole bottle. There might be threats of retaliation, but beyond a few finger jabs and a bit of manhandling, Rich wouldn't do anything. How's it feel to be completely powerless, big brother? Justin thought as he poured the pills back in the bottle. All but three. He stashed the bottle back where he'd found it, and with a triumphant grin, locked himself in his bedroom. By way of group text, he passed the news of his bounty onto his buddies, surprised they didn't share in his enthusiasm. There was a sense of reluctance Justin could feel ruminate from the phone, one which he couldn't understand. He'd assumed Jimmy and Jay would be gung-ho. After all, these were the friends he'd been chugging beers with for months, sharing fantasies of one day sampling hard drugs. The buddies who joined him in slashing tires and busting windows when the alcoholic haze had them crawling out of their skin. Each one desperate to prove to the others how bad they could be, to behave without the restrictions of conscience. And now? It took some coaxing, but the boys agreed to meet Justin by the baseball diamond at 9 p.m just as they always had. But it was closing in on ten o'clock, and there he stood. Alone. Both Jimmy and Jay spouting off excuses so ridiculously transparent, they may as well have been the product of a grade school kid's imagination. Then, nothing. They hadn't sent anything since 9.43, which led Justin to believe they communicated in secret agreed to pull the plug on this before it started. Justin knew them well enough to know exactly how they operated, 
and this led Justin to believe he'd be spending this warm summer evening alone. He could take one of the pills himself, but where was the fun in that? Jaw set, he lifted the phone again, activated the home screen. 10.07. He scrolled through his contacts, found Jimmy, dialed. The call went straight to voicemail. Same when he attempted Jay. Rage pulsed within him. Rage fueled by what he considered to be dual betrayals and a sullying disappointment. This was to be a night to remember, and now all his plans came crashing down. All because his partners in crime were too chicken shit to take things to the next level. He'd put his neck on the line by stealing those pills, and for what? Before he could control himself, Justin kicked a patch of dirt by home plate, sending a cloud of dust into the orange-tinted night. Gripping the phone, he chewed his bottom lip and tried to devise other plans. What if he showed up at Jimmy's front door, pills in hand? What if he told Jimmy's parents that Jimmy scored them from an unknown source and kept trying to convince Justin to share in the illegal act of taking them? What if Justin spun the table the other way and swore this had all been Jimmy's doing? The boys communicated through an application which deleted their chats within 60 seconds of receipt, especially while planning their next Friday night excursion. So what proof did Jimmy have to accompany his innocent cries? Nothing. Except Jay. And Jay's family lived on the wrong side of the tracks. Collected welfare while Jimmy's parents worked hard to maintain their beautiful suburban home and remain pillars of their community. They wouldn't be at all interested in what Jay or his white trash parents had to say. Revenge is better than Christmas, Justin thought. Grinning from ear to ear, he took a step forth, creeping out of the orange light and into the black, when something behind him rang out, something sharp and metallic, like a firm object rattling the batting cage. Justin turned to look behind him, saw movement in the shadows by the bleachers. He opened his mouth to call out, assuming Jimmy and Jay changed their minds. But the figures he saw moving about weren't that of his partners in crime who were thin and lanky. Awkward. These figures moved with confidence and ease, and stopped short when they realized they'd been made. Who is that? Justin called, feeling as though his feet were rooted to the earth. Nothing. They didn't respond. Didn't move. Four of them. As Justin's eyes adjusted, he was certain there were four. Come on, he said, fighting to keep his anxieties hidden. Who is that? From the opposite side of the cage, a blinding light sprang. A light so harsh, it burned his retinas and forced him to lift a hand to shield his tearing, squinted eyes. Another light. This one as bright and as strong filling Justin with a sudden and uncontrollable fear. That fear turned to raw terror when the figures began to move and Justin realized they were rounding the cage, coming toward him, closing in, fast. He would have screamed, but his breath felt lost in the strange sensations flowing through him, would have spun on his heels and took off, but his legs were rigid and stiff, like those of a department store mannequin. The lights grew near and he felt hypnotized by the inescapable glare. Something reached out from behind the light and encircled his forearm, causing an electrical charge that sent him into flight or fight mode. No! He heard himself cry as he wrenched his arm free and turned to run. Too frightened to look behind him, he could feel their oncoming presence, knew they'd given chase. He had no choice but to carry on toward the woods, where he'd lost his virginity to Anita Bertram at the school year's end. Educated by pornographic videos he'd streamed online, Justin treated Anita the same way he'd seen the women in those videos. Pounded her hard, drove himself deep inside, interpreting her small, mousy squeals as moans of pleasure. But she never said no, never told him to stop. And so he carried on, his flesh colliding with hers until he noticed a smear of blood beneath his navel. 
His concern was for himself, and so he stopped and withdrew, examining his penis in the gray light of dusk. Unbeknownst to him, Anita seized the opportunity to dress, and by the time he looked up, her jeans were zipped and buttoned, bloodstained underwear in her quaking hand. She was crying. And for the first time, perhaps ever, Justin wondered if he'd done something wrong. I... Anita began, tears welling in her deep brown eyes. I never want to see you again. And before Justin could reply, she took off running, as if she believed he'd give chase. The feel of his phone slipping from his hands, moistened grip, snapped Justin back to reality, and the sound of it meeting the ground he trampled told him how much trouble he was in. For the figure stayed on his tail, never pausing to relent. A touch of sadness came over him, as he made peace with the reality that he wouldn't be coming out of these woods alive. Someone would find him. Eventually. And when they did, they'd find the pills stuffed in his front jeans pocket. He didn't want his parents drawing incorrect conclusions. That their youngest son had gotten himself addicted to drugs and more than likely killed because of it. With the same hand he'd used to clutch the phone now lost somewhere in the darkness of the woods, he pulled the pills from his pocket and flung them with all that remained of his waning strength. Panting, unable to run anymore, he stopped, dropped to his knees, fell forward. Something pushed him onto his back, and as the lights and figures closed in, Justin fell deep into blackness. We hope you've enjoyed this sample of Drowning in Oceans of Black, written by Brandon Ford, read by Michael Butler. The full audiobook is now available on audible.com, exclusively from Carter Malloy Publishing.